Welcome to the OpenNTF November uh, webinar. Today's topic is HCL same time V12. And uh, we just had a little technical issue that we've dealt with, but we're ready to go, so we will proceed. Um, my name is Graham Akers, and uh, assisting me with the webinar today is uh, OpenNTF board members Roberto Bocadoro and Jesse Gallagher. And our presenters are Eric Schwab and Harvig Schauer. So let's get on with things here. Um, just our normal quick thank you to the sponsors of OpenNTF, which are HCL and Prominic, uh, and they've uh, done a lot behind the scenes to make the organization run, and we really appreciate their support. And with respect to the community, I think everybody's well aware of uh, how OpenNTF works. Um, we've uh, just started our new board uh, for the 23-24 year, and um, are working on some ideas for how we can, uh, um, I guess, not so much change, but uh, potentially enhance and focus the things that we're doing for the community. Um, so stay tuned for that. And um, again, we're always looking for people to participate. Uh, and if you don't know how you can participate, by all means, just put your hand up and we'd be happy to have a conversation with you and see if there's something that uh, fits your skill set or, or area of interest. Quick note about things that are going on in the community right now. Uh, for the fall and into the winter, we've been running a blogathon. Uh, and basically, we're encouraging people to share what they know with the community, whether that be in a blog or a video or some kind of documentation, uh, or even saying, hey, I've used this uh, application that I downloaded from OpenNTF for years, and it works on V12, and I'm really happy with it, and here's how you can take advantage of it too. Um, we have our Discord server, and uh, basically we've got a channel in there where if you've got something that you'd like to share, you can post it in there, uh, and we will send you an OpenNTF badge for part participating in the blogathon. Um, and uh, right here is the link to be able to actually join Discord. Um, feel free to hit that QR code, and you can log into our server. Uh, we've got close to 700 people from the community that participate uh, to you know greater or lesser degree. Uh, I saw over 100 people logged in earlier this morning when I was on. Um, so just jump in there, and that's the kind of the community hub for places to go to ask questions, get answers to the kinds of things that you're um, trying to find, and um, share what you know. So we'll see you there. Upcoming events. Uh, it's next week. Yes, next week is the Let's Connect Nordic User Group live and in person, November 21st in Copenhagen and November 23rd in Stockholm. Uh, and then following that, uh, the week following Thursday is going to be the OpenNTF Repair Cafe for admin topics. Uh, we've also got the uh, development topics admin repair cafe slated for the first week of December. And uh, a little further off into April of 2024, Dio is running uh, Engage in Antwerp. Uh, so that's the, a lot of the stuff that's going on in the community right now. Uh, as far as our webinars are concerned, uh, coming up in December, we've we've done a, a kind of a fun thing the last couple of years where we basically just have an open forum where everybody can join in and uh, just uh, say hi and uh, and share a small drink and and um, you know just be together as a community. So we've got some dates coming up for that shortly, uh, and then we'll get back to our regular technical schedule in January. Um, Kim Greeny and Paul Albright are going to be talking about debugging in Domino. With respect to this presentation, uh, we'll have questions at the end. So by all means, use the questions panel in the GoToWebinar pane. And um, what we will do is we'll hold the answers until the end. So basically, we want to have them included in the webinar, which will be recorded, is being recorded, and will be posted up to YouTube. So we want to have the questions and answers uh, all in a section at the end um, so that they can be in the video. Please do keep your questions specific to the topic at hand. Uh, if there's anything outside of that, by all means, jump over to Discord and uh, you can um, ask and get your question answered there. And that is my last slide. We'll jump over to the presentation. So Eric, I will make you the presenter. And you can take it away. All right, so just a uh, quick can you see the screen? Yep, we're good to go. 
Perfect. Then I think it's time for Hervik uh, to take it away, and I will join later. Okay, let's do this. So, <clears throat> welcome all. My name is Hervik Schauer. I am with uh, Lab Services at HCL. So, uh, we are actually the guys you can hire for uh, implementing our products or getting support with our products besides the normal support things. Um, I gathered and collected quite a bunch of things during my implementations and upgrades I did in the year 2022 and also in the beginning of 2023 after same time 12.0 came out. So uh, I thought it would make sense to put that all together into a presentation and present that at an event. Uh, that's why I reached out to my dear colleague who is doing this webinar today with me to uh, present all that at Engage 2023, which we actually did. And um, I also asked him if we will do this one in a revamped version at the Engage of 2024. Let's see what happens. So stay tuned. So handing over just for introduction to my colleague, Eric Schwalb. Yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. I'm uh, the guy who's working here at HCL in uh, a technical sales role and my experience with the same time goes back all the way to uh, version one which was like in the last century and uh, more recently I started to mess around with the new architecture of same time when it uh, moved to container-based architecture and um, what I'm doing on a daily basis is you know trying out new versions as well as keeping several environments here at hcl running something like the hcl showcase or you may have heard of the hcl sandbox which provides you an option to uh, spin up a test um, on your on your own and, and do the things and, and try out new stuff when new versions become available so yeah i'm looking forward to hopefully present some valuable information for you that you can benefit from when you try to enhance your own uh, same time setups and environments in different scenarios that we're going to cover. And the first topic that we like to start with is about uh, security related stuff like trust stores and key stores. And uh, Herwig is going to present about that. OK, let's do this. So why I'm starting off with this one, because uh, it bit me quite hard during my first implementations, because doing a simple um, proof of concept installation, avoiding all secure connections is one thing. Uh, in a production environment, you normally face uh, the uh, issue of having secure connections uh, all uh, and everywhere throughout the whole product. And this is where I stumbled upon some things uh, I want to share with you. So next slide, please. So fortunately, uh, same time leverages PKCS 12 uh, as file format for all key stores and trust stores. But what I have to find out was that uh, there have been recent changes to uh, PKCS 12 providing new uh, uh, encryption methods, which unfortunately do not work yet with uh, version 12.1 of same time. So the required thing is uh, to avoid problems when configuring secure connections is to create the, cr the trust store in a legacy format, which basically is the older encryption methods within PKCS 12. But you have to specify that uh, directly on the command line if you are using newer versions of OpenJDK key tool or OpenSSL. So if you're running OpenSSL 1.1 or um, in OpenJDK 8 or something like that, uh, it will work uh, with the PKCS 12 created, but it would be better to add the legacy parameter to get the proper working trust store. I put this example right here. It's just a point about this additional parameter. When creating the trust store, you can also convert an existing one to provide the same functionality. If you do so, you at least got the proper trust store and you can be sure it will work in the configuration of same time. It's quite a mess to uh, fiddle around when it's not working properly because you get uh, all kinds of errors with uh, no indication what's really going on. So really be aware of that when it comes to secure communications and trust stores. Remember this slide. Yeah. So next slide, please. Now, 
that we've got proper trust stores and key stores. Let's uh, show, uh, have a look and how you actually configure secure uh, connections. One of the most important things is having a secure connection to your LDAP server, whatever your LDAP server is. Maybe Domino, but it may also be Active Directory or something else. Okay, next slide. So how do you do that? Basically, what I just said, you require a properly created trust store, as I just said. If, and if you are using Domino LDAP, which most likely most of you do, be aware that same time 1201, to be precise, it may change in an upcoming release, but for now, running same time 1201 or 1201FP1, it requires specific ciphers uh, to negotiate properly. So cipher 9D and 2F are still required as of now to uh, properly uh, establish a secure connection to your Domino LDAP server. Uh, I put in this tech note additionally because if you are running Domino 12 or 2 or higher, the, these are considered to be weak ciphers already, which get disabled <clears throat> automatically in Domino 12 or 2. So you have to explicitly re-enable these ciphers until we support higher ciphers in same time to establish a uh, secure connection. So be aware of that. I put all the links to the documentation on the slides, either directly in the slide or in the footer to the official documentation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, we will always distinguish how you configure this in a Docker configuration and in a Kubernetes uh, configuration because you, it's your flavor to choose which implementation you will do. So in a Docker configuration, it's quite simple. You have to put some uh, in parameters to your custom ENV file, which basically is the trust to type is P12. Then where is the trust to file located? Be aware that this parameter is from the site of the container itself. So the container wants to see this file on slash local slash notes that the LDAP trusted.p12. Make also sure, and the third parameter, of course, is the, uh, the uh, password to your PKCS12 uh, trust store. Um, as you in a Docker configuration, you put this PKCS12 file on your host system somewhere. I will in the next slide show you how you wire that together. Be aware that the file permission should be set to not be restricted to some root uh, account only, because otherwise, even if you do the configuration properly, the container won't be able to read the mapped file. So next slide. On the next slide, uh, the next configuration steps are to go to your Docker Compose YAML file and find the community section. And here is uh, in this bold section uh, specifying the volumes um, where you map the PKCS 12 file on your host system to the file within the container. So as we chose local notes data LDAP trustor.p12 on the prior slide, we have to use it the same path here as well. The right side is the container side, whereas the left side is the host system side where the file resides outside the container. So we map it to the container. You can use an uh, absolute path there for sure, but you can also uh, use a relative path relative to your Docker Compose YAML file, of course. Okay, so that's it for the Docker side. Next slide, we move on to the Kubernetes side. In a Kubernetes configuration, the LDAP uh, the trust store, so the PKCS12 file, is stored in a Kubernetes secret. So doing so, you have to import your PKCS12 file into your Kubernetes configuration by creating a, a secret and putting in the PKCS12 file along with the password into the secret. So if you have a look at this kubectl command, it simply says create the secret in my same time namespace where I'm currently running. Give the secret a name. The default in the documentation defaults to LDAP secret. And then it tells the next parameters from literal keys to a password is your keys to a password. So basically this says uh, in within the secret, there is a set which says keys to a password equals your password. And the other thing is to put the file into the secret. 
and you see two equal signs in all these statements, which simply means the left side is how this file is called within the secret. The right side is either the first thing, the plaintext password, and then the second parameter, the path to your PKCS12 file on your host machine while you are creating this secret. So kubectl picks up this file and puts it into this secret and names it ldaptrust.p12. This is what this command does. So these two equal size uh, signs uh, is the same thing as in the Docker Compose YAML where you on the left-hand side have the container side, on the right-hand side the outside side or vice versa. So be aware of that and make also sure this uh, pk 12 file has to be named ldaptrust.p12 within the secret. It doesn't matter how it's named outside while importing, but using these statements is rather important to name it ldaptrust.p12. Okay, so next slide. The next thing you simply have to do, same as you have to do on the Docker side, uh, you now uh, say you um, tell uh, my elder port is likely not 389 but something like 636 which is the default for a secure LDAP you additionally specify LDAP TLS to true so that same time knows it has to establish a secure connection to this server on this port and then the last parameter to set is LDAP config secret which specifies the name of the Kubernetes secret you created prior, which defaults to LDAP-secret as we called it. Yeah, If you choose a different name, specify your different name right here. So that's it uh, for uh, LDAP secure communication, which you likely might face in production environments. On to the next topic, Eric, please. Um, setting up SSO using LTPA. Why do we want that or why do you need that? You need or want that if you want to integrate same time in other products like same time awareness in connections or same time awareness in verse. So you have uh, to establish some SSO between this system and in this topic I will uh, show you how you do this using LTPA which is still quite common. Next slide Eric please. The most important thing I faced was I'm largely dealing with uh, very true customers sticking to our products for many years already. So when it comes to LTPA, for sure there is already some LTPA key in place, which was generate, generated some time years ago in what system ever. In this particular case, I will show you how, uh, how such an LTPK, uh, LTPA key looks like. It's a text file, an encrypted text file containing this stuff. And what I highlighted in bold is the realm, which is in my case, default WIM file based realm, <clears throat> which uh, simply tells me this is likely an LTPA key exported from some connections uh, installation. So uh, if you look at the documentation uh, which shows you how to create an LTPA key in case you haven't got one, it uh, tells you, okay, fire up a Liberty container and run this command and you will get out the key file. And this uh, LTPA key contains a realm and it defaults to default realm, which might be different to the realm you are using in your current environment with words and connections or something like that. So Moving on with same time and integrated in properly requires that you not just have got the LTPA key, the correct LTPA key, but also specifying the appropriate realm. And this was a thing I found out in many custom environments. And what do you have to do? Next slide. So if you got your LTPA key, you wire it to your same time configuration. In Docker, this is done in your .env file. So you on one hand enable LTPA, you specify where is my LTPA key in terms of where it is located on my host machine. The LTPA keys file specifies where the LTPA key is to be found from within the container. And I would suggest leaving the defaults there. Then the 
again, the password, of course, and additionally, the realm, which is not part of the official product documentation or was not part at the time I did this presentation. So uh, having done that, you also have to edit custom ENV to add the same time authentication to also support LTPN, not just uh, JWT. Having done that, moving on to the next slide, we also have to do a small change in the Docker Compose YAML, which simply says, please also read the environment which has specified called LTPA Realm so that your proper specified LTPA Realm gets picked up by Docker Compose. And if you look up to the volume section, here's the mapping from your host LTPA key file path, which may be anywhere and even the file may be called uh, how you like it but within the container it should be named ltba config ltba.keys does make sense i hope how is this done in kubernetes moving on kubernetes same thing here uh, the ltpa key is stored in a kubernetes secret <clears throat> same thing here create secret generic you give the secret a name and again, the from file directive, the file has to be named ltpa.keys in the container or in your Kubernetes uh, secret. And the right hand side uh, is the uh, path to your host system where you create the secret with the kubectl command. Moving on to the next, what's, what's missing? You have to edit your values YAML file to same as Docker, enable LTPA, specifying the realm in case it's not the default realm, because the default realm is default realm uh, and it may differ. That's why we, uh, I'm showing you this slide. The LTPA uh, key password has to be provided in the same time secrets YAML file, uh, and it has to be provided base64 encoded to avoid issues with uh, special characters. So you simply take your key file password and echo it to a base64 a command and you will get a, a string which you enter then to the LTPA keys password parameter in your same time secrets.yaml. And that's it for Kubernetes. Okay, next topic. Why have we done LTPA? Because we want to integrate with other uh, applications. And also there are a few things you should be aware of. Next slide, Eric, please. So, uh, beginning with same time 12, it is required to enable the uh, legacy web client because it's disabled by default. And this might break some existing um, integration if you uh, simply upgrade to 12, but it's not a big deal to re-enable it. And also a thing you should do, you have to set your content security header so that same time is allowed to render on a different page or a different product like HCL Word versus HCL Connections. To integrate together, some kind of SSO is required. We just talked about LTPA, but it also might be SAML, of course. Yeah. So next slide, Eric, please. How is that done in Docker? To enable the uh, legacy client, you uh, go to your Docker Compose YAML and at uh, the same time external war integration equals true to your environment within the same time proxy section. And if you set your content security policy headers, you do this in your custom.env file, the parameter is called content security policy. And Normally, uh, you might tighten that one down. You narrow it down to your uh, LTPA DNS domain, which is your SSO LTPA to domain. But you might choose to narrow that one uh, much more down. I just put in the wildcat example. Okay, moving on. In Kubernetes, uh, same thing here. You go to the, your values YAML file and um, put the parameter enable legacy chat client to true. I do not elaborate that this was documented wrong because it was called enable legacy client, which did not work, but it's meantime corrected within the documentation. And the content security policy, same thing here in values.yaml in the global section named content security policy. Having done that, uh, 
it should properly work when you fire up, for example, your connections integration, your verse or INOS integration, as you can see right here. And you, again, should be able to get your uh, awareness status and your chat and contact list. Okay, handing over to you, Eric, with your next topics. Yes, thank you. Um, now let's take a closer look at the branding capabilities in the same time. Um, as you might have, might have uh, heard already, there are a few ways to make the same time web UI more closely matching, for example, um, your, um, your corporate settings. So what can you do actually for the same time web meeting UI? And that's quite important to understand. We are not talking about the chat side of things here. We are talking now about the meeting web UI you have the option to define your own custom product name or meeting service name, and you can replace the same time product logo, for example, with your own company logo and also use a custom meeting background image. If we take a look at these two screenshots here on the right, these are taken from an HCL internal demo environment where we just simply replace the product logo with our own custom logo here. And we also um, turned that custom logo on in a meeting. So when someone is talking in a meeting, you see usually on the uh, upper left, the same time product logo, but we replace that as well with our own custom logo. These two examples here on the left, they are taken from a DNAC lab environment. And you can see in addition to changing the logo, we also renamed the product. We call this thing or this implementation the DNAC lab meeting server. So that's also something that you can do. How are you actually going to do that? Um, in Docker, it's quite simple. You go to the custom.env file and then you have these up to five different variables that you can use. And what's important to understand here is where you need to actually place your custom logo file, your custom graphics file. Um, it's the same principle that Tervik already explained earlier. By specifying the React app product logo variable, this path here is the virtual path as seen from inside the container. So slash images slash branding actually maps to or corresponds to the slash web slash branding subdirectory underneath the same time config directory on the Docker host. And if we take a look at the directory listing, you can see this in this example here. This is where your custom um, logo file, your custom graphics file actually resides. Um, as an alternative to specifying a virtual pass, as you can see here, you can also use a URL instead, which points to wherever you placed that uh, graphics file. The only thing which is important, if um, you use that method of specifying a URL that points to the graphic file somewhere else, um, this location does not uh, have to be protected. So um, you must make sure that you can grab the logo file from that URL location without the requirement to authenticate. Um, for the branding topic, Alesh has put together a nice white paper which shows additional step-by-step -step instructions that I, I would also like to refer you to. Now, having seen how this is done on Docker, how does it work on Kubernetes? Um, it's basically the same principle, and as we've seen before, um, customizations are usually specified within the global section of the values.yaml file, and that's this exact same thing here. Uh, the variables that you need to specify are called product name, product logo, meeting banner image, and meeting background image. And same applies here, what I just explained on the Docker side. Instead of using a virtual file pass, you can use a URL instead. And actually, this has an additional advantage in the Kubernetes deployment. If you deploy same time on Kubernetes, um, a lot of files, including the branding files, are stored into what is known as a persistent volume. And um, this is like the backend storage that the same time pods will then use to store their files. And on this uh, small screenshot here, you can see 
the content of such a persistent volume for a deployment where the persistent volume is being provided through NFS. So um, one advantage of using a URL instead of a um, relative file path is that you don't have to copy your custom logo file into the persistent volume. You can just refer to it in this way. Okay, next topic, we are going to talk about the contact lists or the buddy lists. And um, it's important to understand what has to happen to those buddy, buddy lists if you're coming from an earlier version of same time. Take it away, Herwig. Okay, me again. Yeah, as I just outlined, uh, you're right. It's maybe one of the most important things being up to same time 12.0 is that the community and the proxy server are also containerized, which requires the migration of all the contact and oh, also known as body lists from the WP user info.nsf database to and where are they migrated to? To the Mongo database, the same database you use already for your persistent chat and other things. So having said that, uh, this is a mandatory requirement. Otherwise, it will start from scratch with no uh, body lists, which is normally not the thing you want to achieve. What you need to know, we provide the tooling for doing this, both for Windows, Windows and for Linux systems. Uh, we support. Uh, most same time versions out there, older ones than seven, uh, same time 9.0 uh, are not supported due uh, to the fact that the tooling is a Java code and it won't run on these old Java versions. Uh, it's designed to be unzipped directly on the HCL same time server, but I may uh, add some more information to that. And the other thing I want to make you aware, be aware that there is limited character encoding in, uh, capabilities within this script. So in case you have a very, very serious uh, password with many, many special characters, be aware it might not work. Have a look at the script. So how is it done? Let's uh, show you how this is done on Windows. So you unzip uh, the... Uh, notes migration zip file which is provided as part of the same time installation kit you unzip this one directly in the domino program directory of your same time 11.6 or whatever uh, same time community server and then you edit the notes migration user input.txt file which is you can see in the screen should beneath uh, and specify to match your environment so where is my vp user in nsf located where is the mongo connection url to migrate to which might be your side-by-side -side Mongo instance or your existing Mongo instance. And then you simply run that script. And uh, I want, really want to add, run it in an elevated uh, command window because normally the Domino program directory tends to be uh, protected from an NTFS perspective. And as the batch file wants to write files there, uh, it will fail if it's not an elevated mode. Okay, how does it look like? Next slide. The tool uh, runs and shows you the output, what it's doing. If you do not see that it's transferring uh, the documents to the Mongo instance, you likely get a very uh, useful error, what's wrong and what's going on. And after the script has finished, it tells you user migration completed and tells you how many user info records or privacy records have been migrated to your Mongo instance. Uh, on the next slide, you see the same thing for uh, running the tool on Linux. The only difference here is, yeah, you also unzip it to your Domino binaries directory, which might be update shell Domino latest, blah, blah. And then you edit the setenv.sh file to match your environment. This is the file you see underneath in the screenshot. Then you source this uh, environment file and run the nodes migration shell script. On the next screenshot, you see the output. It's pretty neat uh, running it on Linux. You also have a progress bar, fair enough. 
And having done it either way on the Windows or Linux uh, method, whatever is um, uh, applicable to your environment, on the next slide, I opened up the Mongo Compass and you look at the user info database and the storage collection and you should find your migrated documents there. Yeah. Okay, so basically that's what you have to do there. If you do this correctly, uh, it shouldn't uh, make any problems. The only thing I want to add is if you do it in a side-by-side -side migration, yeah, you likely do some test migration and test if you see your context list rather before doing the final cut and moving over your, to your new production environment, you might want to drop the whole user info uh, database again and uh, refill it with the script rather than rerunning the script, which is possible to do because there is an additional parameter like the skip attribute list which is there to avoid uh, moving duplicate entries to the Mongo database but I would rather recommend simply empty it after your test runs and on your final day of switching over rerun the whole thing from scratch to get your latest data shut down your old system and fire up the new one in the way you are doing your migration okay so next topic also oh sorry i pressed the wrong button so next topic again uh, in regards to mongo uh, we are migrating contact list to mongo and maybe you have got some mongo database already in place for persistent chat because you're running same time 10 or 11 and on the next slide i put together uh, the MongoDB version supported throughout the uh, same time releases. This started off with MongoDB 3.5, and now with same time 12.01, we also support same time six, ah, so same time six, MongoDB six, sorry. Uh, I refer to the system requirements underneath. So, likely, if you move to same time 12, you also want to upgrade your Mongo database, yeah? And I thought it would be a good idea to show you that. Basically, uh, we always refer to the official MongoDB documentation as this is not part of our product, but um, as you might want to do this, I outline how you do it. Next slide, please. Again, please follow the official MongoDB documentation. I put the link down there. So. Doing it in the in-place method on an existing MongoDB replica set. So a replica set consists at least of three members. You might have just one primary, then the thing is easy. That's why I outlined it for a simple replica set with uh, one primary and two secondaries. So you start uh, upgrading the MongoDB binaries to the next official supported release so it would step by step and not from 3.5 to 6 uh, so you move from 3.5 for example to 4.4 or something like that you upgrade the binaries on the secondaries the next step is to step down the primary so that an already upgraded secondary becomes the new primary then you are able to upgrade the binaries on the step down former primary which is now also a secondary and having done that on all three members the last command is simply to increment the feature compatibility version which is a mongo shell command which is uh, in detail outlined in the mongodb documentation so basically that's the way how you do it if you do it in an in-place approach on the next slide, uh, I show you how you can do this in a side-by-side -side approach because I got a bunch of customers who wanted to test uh, the new system side-by-side, -side, most of the times also because of switching operating system platforms or upgrading these, or uh, due to different reasons, they chose a side-by-side -side approach. So we implemented same time 1201 besides an existing same time production environment and to test uh, how you get the data from your old mongo database to your new mongo database you might also leverage mongo dump and mongo restore basically mongodb documentation clearly outlines it is recommended to restore to a matching major version so 
rather not to uh, dump a 3.5 database and restore it to a 4.4. .4. Um, I found out that the most important thing is to use the exact versions of Mongo dump. I basically had no real problems in restoring across major versions, but I cannot recommend that here. Um, but I just tell you, give a try. It will likely work. So in the first step, dump out your uh, existing databases, with, which might be the meeting the mobile offline and or the chat logging database, if you just use chat logging and haven't used meeting before. And the last command, I just put it in italic because if you're running 11 to 6, you haven't got your uh, body lists in a Mongo database. It would just be applicable to a, a same time 12 or system. You move over to a 12 or 1 system, but just uh, hear the command also for your reference. And on the next slide, on your new MongoDB server, you transfer the backups to your uh, new Mongo database instance and simply run the Mongo restore command there. Um, providing the path to your, uh, in this case, slash restore directory, where I copied over the dumps I made on the old system. Basically, that's the deal. No rocket science, uh, but it turned out to be a very valid method in uh, doing it this way when uh, upgrading same time in a side-by-side -side approach. Okay, Eric, the yeah. topic. Thanks. Um, let's move on with the topic of same time monitoring, a capability that was introduced to same time 12 more recently. And as of 1201, we have the capability to build a same time monitoring dashboard based on Grafana. And I'd like to explain a little bit how that works and what you need to pay attention to. When it comes to monitoring, it's important to understand that the same time provides several HTTP endpoints where you can simply go to and grab a lot of statistics about the different chat and meeting services. Having said that, that means that you can actually use any kind of tooling that you like in order to collect, store, analyze, and later on potentially visualize those statistics or those metrics. Of course, the recommended way is to use the tooling that we provide with the product, which is of same time 1201 is a Docker Compose monitoring YAML file. And you can use that file to fire up a monitoring stack, which consists of several containers, including Prometheus and Grafana. And the job of these containers is to simply talk to the these different H point, HTTP endpoints on the same time site, grab the statistics from there, put them into their own uh, database on Prometheus, and then finally um, you can fire up Grafana and create a dashboard. And in order to create such a dashboard, we also provide JSON files in the same time product, which you will then import to Grafana in order to actually create that dashboard. So that's from a uh, overall perspective how the process works. Um, when it comes to monitoring, of course, you need to consider a few things here. First of all, where do you want to run these monitoring components? In the case of a same time deployment on Docker, by default, the monitoring components would run on the very same system, on the same Linux host. But if same time monitoring is just one aspect as part of an overall monitoring strategy in your um, uh, in your company, then you may want to consider running these monitoring components explicitly somewhere else, not directly on the same time server, but on some other system. That's also quite possible. You may want to make a decision whether you want to collect also system and container metrics, things such as CPU and RAM usage, disk space left, and all kinds of other metrics, or if you only want to look at same time specific statistics, things like how many chat users are currently logged on or how many concurrent meetings are currently running on my environment. Another question to consider is how often do you want to collect metrics data? 
more often, obviously, will put more load on the same time server. And when you make that decision, in case you want to deviate from the defaults, keep in mind that monitoring via that approach with Prometheus and Grafana and finally visualizing the stats in a dashboard, if you do that, you are actually not building a real-time monitoring system. What does that mean? Um, let's say it's 12.15 and um, someone is starting a meeting on your environment. So you should not expect that additional meeting to show up on your Grafana dashboard at 12.15 and five seconds. That's not how this works. Why? Um, because the processing through that chain of monitoring components will take some time and also the same time HTTP endpoints, they are not refreshing their values every second or so. So for example, the statistics about the video bridge um, is only refreshed on the HTTP endpoint every five seconds. So it doesn't make sense to uh, tell the overall system, go and collect uh, new stats every single second. That wouldn't make any sense. Another important question is, why do you want to monitor environment? What types of questions would you like to answer with that? Um, a question such as, I want to see what's currently going on, like what's the current load on my environment? How many users in total are active in how many different meetings? That's one type of question. I want to see what's currently going on versus I would like to get an idea about the adoption of the new version of same time. So maybe you just introduce same time 1201 to your end users, and then you want to take a look at how that environment is being adopted by the end users over like say the period of the next three months or so. That's a totally different question. And depending on what you actually want to do with it, that has an effect on how long you want to store the metrics data and where you want to store that metrics data, which means that you may want to configure a persistent volume specifically for the Prometheus and Grafana based data, also an option that you have available here. Okay, let's take a closer look at monitoring same time on Docker. Um, all the same time services, they are defined in the Docker Compose YAML file and the monitoring services as I just pointed out there, defined in a corresponding Docker Compose monitoring YAML file. And the nice thing is, these components, they all run on the same Docker network. What does it mean? It means you do not need to expose any ports of these monitoring services to the local Docker host. And also, you do not need to open the firewall on any of these ports except for one thing, except for the Grafana web UI, because that's ultimately the component that you want to access as an administrator for configuration and for finally displaying all these nice dashboards. So keep that in mind. Um, like I said, no need to open any of these ports on your firewall, except for the Grafana port. The default Grafana port is 3000. In the file we provide out of the box, it's being mapped to a 3001, but you can always change that to whatever port you like. Um, one word of advice, the monitoring YAML file that we provide out of the box will try to pull the C Advisor image, which is one of the monitoring components from Docker Hub. Do not do that. Why? Because the image that is um, located on Docker Hub is deprecated. Instead, go to the Google Container Registry and pull the latest version of that container image for the C-Advisor component from there. In fact, if you go to Docker Hub, you will end up here and you will see this reminder, go to GCRIO and pull the latest version of that image from there, which means that you simply go ahead and modify the entry for the C-Advisor service in that YAML file and point it to the GCRIO address as shown in that screenshot. That's all you need to do. And like I said, there is really no need to open a port for the C advisor or for any of the other components except for Grafana, so you can comment it out. Um, if you want to access Grafana, typically you would like to do that 
via HTTPS, not just via HTTP. In other words, you need to secure access to the Grafana web UI by TLS. And there are many different options of how you can achieve that. One very simple to achieve way is to do it as shown in the screenshot here. When you um, go to the Grafana service in the monitoring YAML file, you specify a few additional settings, like you tell it use HTTPS as your protocol, not HTTP. Here's where you see the required files that make up the TLS certificate. Again, that's a virtual file pass, and we've already seen that concept many times already. You then use the volumes definition, and you map wherever on your physical host the required TLS certificate files are located, you map those files into the virtual file system for the Grafana container. This example that you see here, it makes use of the built-in Let's Encrypt integration that we're going to cover in a moment. But that's just probably the most simplest way to secure access to the Grafana web UI. Other options that you have is you can place another proxy server in front of the Grafana web UI, like a separate Nginx, or you could even use the built-in Nginx container and add a configuration for Grafana to the built-in uh, Nginx. Uh, also keep in mind that in Grafana, you can define additional roles, like you could have an administrator who is allowed to create new dashboards or to modify existing dashboards, and you could define another role, like call it junior admin or whatever, and restrict uh, the, the, the rights of that junior admin so that uh, he or she will only be available to just take a look at the dashboard. So you can have um, um, yeah, a lot of different configurations uh, by going to Grafana and uh, see what you can do with that. Now, in Grafana, you of course need to create a dashboard. And the way you do that is you fire up the Grafana web UI and then you import the JSON file that we provide with same time. Um, by doing that in Grafana, you need to tell Grafana where to find Prometheus. The same time documentation tells you to put in a URL like this, but you can forget about that. Why? Because as I've already explained, the monitoring services and the same time services, they are all running on the same Docker network, which means they can already talk to each other by their service name. So there is no need to go through such a um, URL as you see that here on the right hand side. Instead, you just specify the service name. In that case, the service is called Prometheus. That's how you would specify to Grafana where it can find Prometheus. OK, how does such a monitoring dashboard look like? This is the overall section of the monitoring dashboard, which gives you a nice overview about what's going on, how many chat proxy sessions, how many chat logins we have, how many meetings. So you see this is a taken from an environment where we have pretty much no traffic. Um, then this dashboard has additional sections. You see a detailed section about the chat proxy, how long has it been up and running, um, how long it took to get up and running, some nice graphics about loads and CPU usage and so on. So a lot of details that you can see, including details about the JVMs that are in use. Um, and finally, also a lot of details about the meeting services that we have here, including the current network load, network traffic going in, going out. So it's quite helpful. Um, one word about the upcoming version, same time 1202. This will, um, we will take this concept a bit further and actually include that Grafana based dashboard into what is known as the, no, the new uh, web admin UI that's coming up with same time 1202. So, um, yeah, we will enhance that even more. How do you set this up on um, Kubernetes? The same time product documentation tells you to install what is known as the Cube Prometheus stack. That's a open source project widely in use with Kubernetes installations. And this stack already includes Grafana, which means there is really no need 
for an additional Grafana installation as the same time product documentation would suggest. So um, you can basically skip that step in the same time product documentation, no need to install Grafana additionally. Before setting up that Q Prometheus stack, I highly recommend to familiarize yourself with how this stack is working. And one of the best ways I found to do that, to familiarize myself with that is a, what I believe a great YouTube video that I've linked here that is about an hour long and the way it presents how that stack works, what are the concepts behind, how you can use it to monitor, monitor all kinds of third party software is really easy to understand and easy to follow. So I highly recommend if you want to deal with that topic, spend that hour, watch that video that will really help you to understand the concepts. And one of the concepts that the stack introduces is the concept of a service monitor. And that's important because the Helm charts for same time, when you deploy same time, these Helm charts will also create the required service monitors. And Prometheus then later on will find out if those service monitors exist on the Kubernetes environment and if they have been marked in a way so, so that Prometheus should pick them up. And that's how the whole monitoring stack then works for same time. Also, the values.yaml file that comes along with that stack, it will tell you what the initial admin password is that you need in order to fire up the Grafana web UI. You can find it also here. And it will tell you about tons of other customization options because again, like I said in the Docker example, at the end of the day, if you want to set up the Grafana dashboard using the Grafana web UI, you would typically want as an admin to be able to walk up to any kind of workstation where a browser is running, simply fire up the URL, log into Grafana and then get access to the dashboard. And in order to do that, you need to do a few things. Like for example, you could expose Grafana as a load balancer service or you could create an ingress for Grafana. And um, if that's what you like to do, then I highly encourage you to take a look at the values.yaml file because there you will find an example and more explanations of um, how you can create such an ingress. All right, so if uh, you like to get step-by-step -step instructions, including screenshots of how you set up this monitoring stack for a Kubernetes-based same-time deployment, we have a course available free of charge. It's called the Deploying HCL Same Time Premium 12 on Kubernetes Self-Paced Workshop. Wow, long title. <laughs> Go to Software U, register for that course, download the material, and there you will find a chapter called Setup Same Time Monitoring Dashboard. It includes all the details, all the step-by-step -step instructions. All right, next topic that I'd like to talk about is integration with Let's Encrypt because at the end of the day, when you spin up a same time instance, either on Docker or on Kubernetes, you need to secure the access from an end user's perspective, of course, by using TLS. And for that, you need to get the TLS certificate. And one of the options that you have here is by using a free of charge certificate from a service such as Let's Encrypt. And the good news is that there is an built-in integration as of same time 1201 on Docker. We are talking about same time 1201 on Docker first. If you configure same time 1201 on Docker, then it will automatically request, retrieve and apply a TLS certificate from Let's Encrypt. How does that work? This built-in integration is based on what is known as the ACME protocol. That's a standardized protocol that a service such as Let's Encrypt uses. And as part of that protocol, the components, they do what is known as an HTTP01 challenge. And from a high level perspective, the Let's Encrypt website acts as an ACME server. It sends a challenge to your ACME client and your ACME client is actually the Nginx component as part of your same time stack. So this Nginx component within your same time stack answers to that challenge. 
And in order for that communication to work, the ECMI server will ask your same time environment via an inbound HTTP request coming in on port 80 for what is known as a secret at a well-known URL. So don't worry, that's not a security risk. The only thing that's going on via port 80 is actually the completion of that HTTP01 challenge. No end user comes in via port 80. What do you need in order to make this work? The fully qualified domain name of your same time server must obviously be registered in a public DNS. Otherwise, Let's Encrypt will not be able to find your server and then will not be able to talk to your server. And of course, your same time server must be accessible from the public internet via HTTP port 80, either directly or through another proxy in between, but I recommend to open it up directly. Again, that's not a security risk. Now, that's all nice and great for the same time 1201. The not so good news is that this built-in integration is currently broken in 1201 FB1, but don't worry, we got you covered. There's a workaround. So let's take a look. What do you need to do for same time 1201? Pretty simple. You go to the .env file, you change the to the HTTP port to AD. You already know why, because I just explained why. You enable the HTTP redirection and you enable Let's Encrypt simply by commenting out or by removing the comment sign from, from those lines. These lines are already in the .env file. You just have to remove the comment in order to enable Let's Encrypt. You specify the domain, or in other words, the public address of your same time server, the email address of your admin. And, and I cannot stress this enough, you, if you set up this integration for the very first time, make sure you use what is known as the staging service for Let's Encrypt by removing that comment sign first. This turns on the use of the staging service for Let's Encrypt. The staging service is there for a reason. Let's Encrypt uses that staging service so that you can throw as many API calls against the service as you like without breaking anything. If you don't use the staging service and talk directly to Let's Encrypt's production service and you have a misconfiguration in your environment, this could result in same time sending requests over requests over requests to the Let's Encrypt production service, which could result in your Let's Encrypt account being locked out. And then you need to wait, wait for a few days before you can try again. So always, always, always start by using the staging service first. What else do you need to do? In Docker Compose YAML, we already learned that the component of the same time stack that's actually doing the work here is the Nginx service. So we need to tell the Nginx service to pay attention to an environment variable that's called Let's Encrypt Your Staging. So if you enable this in .env, you also need to tell the Nginx service, go ahead and keep an eye on that variable. If it's set to one, then use the staging service. Also make sure that you specify the public address of your same time server in custom.env and only in custom.env, not somewhere else. And that's all you need to do in 12.01. In 12.01 FP1, like I said, here's the workaround, quite simple. In .env, you specify the HTTP port for something other than 80, 8000, for example. And in Docker Compose.yaml, you add two more lines to the Nginx service. This line here, user colon 00, this basically tells the Nginx service to run as root. And this additional line in the port section will then provide an inbound way for Let's Encrypt to talk to the Nginx service. Again, these two additional lines, they are just a temporary workaround or temporary fix required for FP1. Um, a few days ago, I tried an early build for same time 1202, and I can confirm that this problem has been fixed in 1202. If everything is set up correctly and you look into the log of the Nginx container, you will then see how that works. You can see that Nginx is actually talking to the Let's Encrypt service and it's creating 
and through registering an account, creating a domain key and so on, they're going through that challenge. And then at the end of this HTTP one challenge, the Nginx container will begin downloading the certificate. As you can see here, it begins certificate and certificate. It will then move that certificate into these files and they will finally end up in a subdirectory underneath your same time config directory. Sometime, uh, the, the subdirectory is slash web slash acme certs and has an, a name that corresponds to the FQDN of your same time server. So that's where the two files that make up the TLS certificate will end up. And that's where we actually pointed Grafana to earlier on in the example. Now that's how it works on Docker. How does it work on Kubernetes? On Kubernetes, same time does not include a built-in integration. However, you can use another very popular component known as the cert manager for Kubernetes. Cert manager will make use of what is known as a CRD or custom resource definition. And that's a mechanism that allows software to extend the Kubernetes object model and introduce new custom objects. In that case, custom objects such as certificates, certificate requests, and certificate issuers are created by CERT manager. And what you do in a nutshell is you install the CERT manager following their standard documentation. You then create new Kubernetes objects of type cluster issuer, one for staging to test with first, and then one for production. And the way you tell same time to actually use these new capabilities is by modifying the ingress.yaml file that is included in the same time hunt charts. So you go to that file, you add this line here, and by doing that, you are then ultimately telling same time or the ingress controller that provides access to same time to actually go and talk to the cert manager and request the certificate for the staging service or for the production service. That's how this works. Um, again, you see this file here in the editor, and here is where you add that additional line. In that case, this uh, setting refers to the production environment. If you have staging instead of prod, you would tell it to talk to the staging service. Um, as before, there are step-by-step -step instructions with screenshots and everything as part of that um, free of charge course that I talked about before. Go to the prepare deployment chapter within that course. That's where we'll, you will find all the detailed instructions if you want to set this up using step-by-step -step instructions. Okay, another topic um, is um, if you want to implement your own stun server. Back to you, Herwig. Uh, thanks, Eric. Well, uh, last but not least, uh, one of my dearest topics, because I can tell you I face this issue at almost uh, each and every custom installation I either did myself or planned or was troubleshooting. It's about the audio and video streams and how the participants find uh, to each other and to the JVB itself. Uh, because stun is required for doing that. And I will explain you what this is all about and why it's rather important to know why this is important. Okay, next slide. So what's stun? Basically, I put that together, um, many useful informations, but why do we need stun? Let's focus on this particular question. Uh, stun is used as a tool so that the participants can identify where to reach the other participants and at the same time video bridge. This is required to send audio and video streams via UDP to each other. That's why it's rather important to get the proper IP address and the proper port to talk to. And on the next slide, it's simply uh, required because normally you will face environments where not the same time server is located in one particular subnet and all clients are uh, uh, located in the same sub subnet. If this is the case, you don't require stun because you do not traverse any network via NAT 
So uh, having said that, in this graphic, you can see the client reaches out to a stun server and is behind a route to this, so it traverses one network. Yeah, And uh, the request goes to the stun server, and the stun server simply gives the answer, I see you at this IP on this port, which in this case is not the client's local IP address within the corporate network, for example, but rather the router's public IP address. This is what the outside can see talking to the client. And the stun query simply gives back that information to the client so that it can determine where to send the audio video streams to. Rather important, but where are the pitfalls? Go to the next slide, Eric. Why do you want to do that? As I said, um, most of my customers deploy same time in a DMC because they want to use it internally, but also want to make meetings with external users. So in this case, you normally traverse already a net from the internal network to the DMC network. Yeah. Um, but uh, also in DMC deployments, uh, where, and this is the, the thing, if you put a same time environment in a DMC environment, this is the important note um, below. Uh, default, in the default, we wire uh, the Google public stun service for giving back the stun information. So if I put my same time environment in a DMC, and I do nothing else than using the standard configuration, it will try to reach out to the Google Stun servers and what will they give back? They will give back the outside IP address as seen from the internet. Your local uh, clients in your corporate network, on the other hand, get this information back and where do they want to send the UDP stream? Outside of your network, outside to the, in, uh, to the internet and back in. This is normally not allowed in any uh, corporate network. And if it's allowed, you traverse a bunch of networks and you suffer from performance and quality. So um, considering STUN and implementing an internal STUN server will resolve this issue because the idea is implement your internal STUN server and add it to the public STUN servers. Why? Because the stun query gives back a list of results where you are uh, probably uh, uh, reachable. Yeah. So in case of an internal client, it gets the outside view from the external uh, IP addresses, but also through the internal stun server, the internal IP and socket. And if the internal client isn't even capable of uh, communicating with the outside IP address, it still has the internal one and will talk to the internal JVB. And that's why it's rather important to implement uh, additionally an internal stun server if you have such a deployment. Uh, important to know, um, I will show you in the next slides how easy it is to do this, but the uh, same, the, the stun server cannot run on the same machine where same time resides. Why? Because to be seen from the outside, you have to leave the machine. If I put the stun server on the same machine where Docker is running and uh, the query is made, it's just done on the local machine and it will give you back the IP address of the Docker network because this is the interface seen by the host machine. So this won't work. So you have really have to place the stun server besides or somewhere else within your internal network to get the proper stun query back. Yeah. So. How do you do that? It's uh, basically from a technical perspective quite easy. Uh, you simply install Cotern, which is part of almost each and every Linux distribution, at least in, in terms of Red Hat in the Apple releases. It's a really, really small bunch of software. Uh, it's capable of doing a stun and turn. I will just cover stun in this session, but I will cover turn for sure, but maybe on our next session at Engage 2024. Let's see, Eric, what happens. Um, basically, this is all you require to do. You simply create a conf file, adding these parameters, and uh, it, it might differ if you're using Ubuntu or Red Hat. It's slightly different, but basically, it's all the same thing, and you choose a port, which is normally defaults to 3478. 
but you can choose a different one and you simply open up the firewall on the machine where your code turn server is running on this particular port for UDP so that requests can be made to the server. Next slide. Now we simply wire this uh, Intel Stun Server to our configuration, which is quite easy because we add it to the existing list of the external Stun servers, which are already in the default and correspond to the Google Stun servers. You may also use the Coton Utils on your same time server. This is a thing you can do. Uh, Coton Utils uh, are a set of stun and turn client tools to make queries to your stun server and with that you can also make sure that your stun server is working properly is reachable and is giving back the expected response so in case of uh, docker you add uh, that one to your env file on the next slide, same thing for uh, Kubernetes. So in the uh, values YAML file in the global section, there is the parameter JVP stun servers, same values there, simply add it and it will get used. Um, having done that, just before jumping on the next session, having mm -hmm. done that, this will result in, if a meeting is opened and the stun queries take place, not just the external ones get queried for where can you see me, but also the internal one, it will compile a list, give back to the client, and the client will choose the proper one to take. That's the idea behind, and it is really, really required to do this in this particular implementation scenarios. Up to you, Eric. Okay, so the last topic that we would like to talk about is same time limited use. Um, because I discovered by talking to many clients that this is what a lot of, especially Domino clients, actually want to use or are already using. Same time limited use means you are entitled to use certain same time chat capabilities for free, i.e. without having to buy additional licenses. And that entitlement comes as part of your Domino license. Now, um, the easiest way to set up an environment that provides same time limited use capabilities is simply to download the file same time 1201fp1.zip from FlexNet and deploy it. Why is that the easiest option? Because with such a deployment, any same time client that you connect to such a deployment will automatically detect the install type of that server as hey, this is a same time limited use server and as a result those clients those same time clients will only expose capabilities to the end user that are in sync with the limited use entitlement so in other words um, for example you are not allowed to use file transfer with the same time limited use entitlement and therefore a same time client connected to, to such a server will not even offer file transfer capabilities. So that's the most simple way. Um, if you have same time limited use entitlement and you decide for whatever reason to deploy an older version of same time, like same time 11.6, for example, then you need to dive into the topic of same time policies. And if you are a customer who, let's say, have 5,000 employees, all of them have a Domino license, and you decide to buy same time premium only for a smaller number of your employees, say like 800 or so, then you will certainly want to run one common environment for those two types of users, for the same time premium users as well as for the same time limited use users. You can certainly do that, and the way you do this is you modify the default user policy after you have deployed same time premium, and you restrict it in such a way that those users that get assigned the default user policy will automatically be limited to the allowed capabilities. And then you create an additional policy, a custom policy, and you configure that one so that it allows all the same time premium features 
that you want to make available to your same time premium end users. Um, here are all the different policy IDs that are affected and I also um, described here what you need to set those to in order to achieve a policy that is compliant with same time limited use. I'm not going to read all these, you can read that later on in the hands out. But it's important to understand the concept. You would modify the default policy to those settings, as you can see here, and in addition, you would create an additional policy. Now, how do you assign policies to same time users or to different groups of same time users? The concept again is quite simple. You create a group in your LDAP directory, and you can see an example of a domino directory being used as the LDAP directory here. You create a group and you add all your same time premium users to that group. In our case, the group is named same time premium users. And then within that custom policy, you assign, first of all, a weight that is higher than the weight of the default policy. That's important. In that case, the weight is 10. And you also assign that custom policy to that LDAP group that you created just for your same time premium users by setting the assignment type to one. This is telling same time, okay, this is assignment um, is for a group with that name you could also assign a policy to individual users, but in our case, in this example, we are assigning it to a group. So that's the concept. Again, how you do that on Docker, quite straightforward. I usually prefer to store any customizations that I make into a separate subdirectory. So that's why the example here tells you to create a separate subdirectory called custom config in this example. And then you copy out the existing policy file, it's called policies.user.xml, from the community container. You copy it out of that container onto your local file system into your custom config directory. That's where it ends up. And you shut down same time. You edit the policies user.xml file and set it to whatever it needs to be set. And when you're done with that, you then need to have a way to tell same time to actually make use of that modified policies file. The way you do that is in Docker Compose, you go to the community service because the community container is the component that actually assigns the policies. So you go to the community section within Docker Compose.yaml and then you map your customized policies file which again, you can call whatever you like on the local host file uh, system. This file, you can call it whatever you like, but within the container, it has to be called policies.user.xml and it has to be seen from the container's perspective underneath local nodes data. So that's how you map it back in. And then you fire up the same time server and you're done. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. How do you do it on Kubernetes? The concept is slightly different here. Again, also my recommendation, create a custom subdirectory where you store the customized file. Then you pull the default files out of the community pod, or more explicitly from the community container. Um, in that case, you have to pull two files, not just the policies user XML, also the policy server XML. Even if you do not plan to modify that one, you have to pull both. Then you edit, for example, the policies user XML file as needed. And then you need to find a way to move it back into the cluster. And the way you do that is with the help of what is known as a config map. So you use kubectl to create a config map, give this config map any name you like, whatever you want to call it, and you tell kubectl to create that config map object from the subdirectory where these two modified files actually reside. So after that, you have that config map, 
And then you need to tell same time to make use of whatever is now in that config map. How do you do that? You add an additional line to the values.yaml file of same time called override community policy with that config map. And obviously the name of that config map here and there, they have to match, right? Now, how do you then tell same time or how do you then actually um, yeah, make same time use of the updated configuration? You'd run a help upgrade command. At the end of that upgrade command, the new values are now in the cluster. And then you basically recycle the community pod by scaling it down and up, which in a nutshell means you're going to restart the community pod. Basically, that's what happens. So it's pretty straightforward. In case you need to make any further modifications to your policies file, it's basically a repeat. Um, you make the additional changes to the policy files in your local file system. You throw away the config map, you create a new config map based on the new versions of your modified files, and then you scale down and up the community pod and you're in business again. So that's how you do it. You can find these instructions with regards to limited use in a separate white paper available here on either via Software U or on the, uh, um, on the HCL support website. And of course, I'm by no means the only one who is writing white papers for HCL. Going to HCL Software U, you will find another set of free available white papers written by Hervik and other colleagues. So I highly encourage you to go there and read these white papers because <clears throat> they are full of great instructions um, that complement what we provided to you in this presentation today. And before we move on to the question and answers portion, I'd like to take the opportunity to invite you to join us for the official launch of Domino 14 and HCL same time 1202, the new version, which is just around the corner. And that launch is taking place on December 7. So feel free to grab a screenshot, take up your smartphone, copy the URL, whatever, and register for that webinar on December 7th. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Graham for hopefully some interesting questions and answers. Thanks, Eric. Uh, that was a, an exceptionally heavy and detailed technical presentation, uh, lots of excellent content. So thank you very much for that. Um, as it turns out, we've maxed out the time that we've got for uh, the webinar today, um, but we don't have any questions. Uh, I'm guessing I certainly felt like as this was going along that, that I would feel more comfortable getting my hands on the keyboard and going through your details step by step. So um, I'm guessing that's how people are feeling. Um, so what I will say is uh, that um, people are welcome to go over to Discord and use the OpenNTF Discord for asking those te technical questions. Um, and in the meantime, we're going to have this presentation posted up within the next day on YouTube. And uh, I'll collect the slides from you, Eric, so that we can post that on our webinars page. And then people can get access to that. Um, and we'll carry on the discussion over on Discord. I think with that, I'll say thanks both to Eric and Herwig, and we'll wrap it up here. Uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again, guys. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Bye.